name and we stroke a left. Jim, are we on? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just wanted to make sure. So we have, we're going smoothly now. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Renee Marie Stokola. I'm Renee Marie, and I have the honor and privilege of uh, coming into your homes and your your cars and your backyards and your phone and your everything. Um, and I'm really honored and privileged. Uh, it really is important that we do this show because strokes are the leading cause of disability in the country. And I believe it's still the fifth leading cause of death. Um, of course, we're dealing with the Corona-19 nowadays, and it really is devastating, the numbers that have gone out. But we're so honored to have um, Dr. Beculus back and Jason back. Uh, Judy's trying to stream on. Everybody knows that when you're doing Zoom, you have difficulties, um, technical difficulties in every single aspect. So we're not going to stop the show um, because uh, these two gentlemen need to go to work at 10 o'clock. Um, but Judy, I hope you get on really quick. Um, but we're going to, I thought that, you know, I always prayed on the concept of this show today. Um, aside from hearing how they're both doing in the in incredible work that they both do. Um, there's two really questions I have, like, number one, what has the stroke world learned from the Corona-19 pandemic? What have we learned? Like, what can we, what can we use and what can we learn to grow and to learn? And the other thing was, when I was researching Dr. Beculus, just refreshing my memory, I saw that he built the team that he works with. And I know that a team is so important. Leaders are so important. And and I love that. And I love that. And so I want to welcome them both to the show. Good morning, both the Dr. Beckulis. Good morning, morning Jason. How are you? Good morning. Today? Good morning. It really is a privilege to have you. Let's start with Dr. Beckulis. How's it been going in your uh, hospital? It's been going good. You know, uh, it's certainly uh, something like we've never seen before, certainly at the beginning of it, as you say, uh, mostly into the end of March, beginning of April. I think all of us uh, were hit by a wave of uh, new kind of patients, and it's been fairly challenging. You know, it disrupted the workflow. Uh, the hospital turned into a big ICU with, uh, in our case, uh, over maybe uh, 500 COVID patients hospitalized. And, uh, at one time? At one time, and over 100 uh, patients on ventilators. So it was a very challenging time. Um, naturally, a lot of the, obviously we had to stop elective cases. So treatment of brain aneurysms and other cerebrovascular pathology was limited, uh, but we also stopped seeing strokes. And, uh, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a bit of a shocker initially, but then kind of speaking to our colleagues from other countries and talking to uh, them and looking at the international experience, we realized that you know, the, the having this pandemic and, and kind of filling up the emergency rooms with, with these patients naturally kept a lot of folks that may develop symptoms, uh, mild uh, potentially, but kept them from coming to the hospital. Or if they had severe symptoms, they would come in late, too late sometimes to get an intervention. So really uh, the impact of COVID on stroke was dramatic uh, by really changing how people respond. You know, you, we always... Uh, we were out there, and I know you're probably doing a more aggressive job than us, spreading the word and 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 uh, spreading awareness and teaching people what they should do and what they should look for uh, when they develop stroke or signs of stroke. And then we all talk about fast face, arm, speech, time to call nine one one. You know, we were spreading the word out there, but the fear of the pandemic was so profound in the communities uh, that uh, gave people second thoughts, and and so the our emergency room, uh, you know, was was just COVID patients, so we we, we didn't see, uh, we didn't we, we weren't seeing much stroke, and then that we saw the opposite phenomenon, where after a month or so with limited strokes, uh, we started seeing a, a very sharp increase in the stroke volumes, and and likely that was because folks did did, did not come to the emergency room, that did not go see their doctor, and were not regulated on their Coumadin, they were not regulated on their antihypertensive medications, they started developing stroke symptoms down the line, and that really exploded uh, 
uh, the number of strokes uh, later on. Now, obviously, were they, Dr. Beckett, it's were they more severe because they didn't come in prior, like you said, were, were the cases more severe? Yeah, I would say, you know, and these are all anecdotal evidence, obviously, but uh, they, in our experience, strokes tended to be a bit more severe because um, they were not tended to on time and some of them likely preventable in, in their in their severity. Uh, but, but, you know, the it was challenging for us to obviously treating this population because in a, in a community like New York, as you know, where the we think the prevalence of COVID-19 was up to uh, 20, 22 percent. Um, the strokes that will come, a, a lot of them, uh, if, if, if the numbers are right, a fifth of them will, will have COVID. So, you know, the precautions that we had to take for the whole team were, were very rigorous uh, to make sure everybody's healthy and everybody was healthy. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was extremely challenging. You know, this, this, this was a very prevalent disease in New York and we were in the epicenter of it with a lot of patients. Uh, you know, obviously we try to minimize our exposure, but, but, uh, it's not, uh, it's not easy. And, and, and truth be told, things are changing now in a, in a much better direction with, uh, a lot fewer uh, coronavirus cases and, uh, uh more, our workflow is is going back into normal, and as far as the hospital is concerned, uh, you know we've we've taken uh, measures above and beyond what we would normally have to really make sure that you know everybody who comes to the hospital is healthy, and that's an important message. And I, uh, you know, what what has happened at the Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center of Long Island is that everybody who shows up in the emergency room or who shows up through the doors of the hospital is an elective case gets tested. So, you know, if, if, if you're not, so that's a tremendous amount of tests. Uh, physicians and staff are getting screened daily and the patients are getting tested when they come to the hospital. Is that the quick test, Dr. Beculis, that you could tell? Uh, so, so, you know, the quick test is great. It's just sometimes a tad bit not as reliable as the PCR uh, that you do, the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, so what we have, uh, what, what we do for the patients is that 48 hours before coming to the hospital to allow for the time for the test to come back, they get they get the nasopharyngeal swab and then they're instructed to obviously isolate. But when, when you're in the hospital, you're surrounded by people who are negative. And the very few patients that are still there that are COVID positive are in a separate unit of the hospital. So the you know, administration, I think, has done a tremendous job to keep uh, people apart and, uh, and, and make sure that when you come to the hospital, uh, for a procedure, and you're you're generally healthy. You leave healthy uh, when it comes to uh, to coronavirus or anything like. That. Yeah. What I, what I heard was like, because my I have a good friend that works in Valley Hospital here in New Jersey, and my daughter works at Hackensack Hospital, and um, they just said it was it was so intense. It was so it wasn't not that it was scary. It was scary to them to go to work, but. It was like their purpose. It was why why they were, you know, they got into what they're doing. And but the the the, the tension and just you had to always stay in that frame. And yes. um and the fact that like um the the pre, the pediatric ward they were holding adult COVID nineteen patients in, it just was so. I mean, I I would have been afraid to go to the hospital. But I think that as things leveled off, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the hospital is the safest place to go because Absolutely. you know what you're doing to keep people distant. So tell us about that. Tell us, share with the audience how important it is and how safe the hospitals are. Yeah, so the hospitals now are tremendously uh, different than what they were a month ago, right? And, uh, you know, it's it's part of what we do because we need we need to promote health in the hospitals and and uh, you know on the provider side the physicians the nurses the technologists the, the advanced practice providers everybody's getting tested and uh, screened rather not tested coming to the hospital so you'll see in the morning people come in everybody's getting their temperatures checked uh, they're getting screened for coronavirus symptoms uh, people are sent home obviously if they the temperature is elevated or, or if they have any symptoms. Uh, they uh, People that work in non-COVID units work only in these units. They don't cross-cover now other COVID units. Uh, the areas of the hospital that 
posted in the past COVID patients have been decontaminated, uh, most of them with very advanced decontamination technology, including UV light. Uh, and, uh, you know, at Good Samaritan Hospital in particular, they're, they purchased a robot that goes in the room and completely decontaminates it by touching everything with UV light. Uh, the operating rooms have all been cleaned and decontaminated and been functional now for a week or so. Uh, the way the hospitals opened, it was a phased approach. It wasn't all in one, uh, but really first initially smaller cases that can go home same day. Uh, that was followed by you know more more severe, more uh, uh, more more advanced cases, and that goes slowly into more and more opening of the capabilities of the hospital. Now everybody in the hospital is wearing a mask regardless of the fact that everybody's tested and screened and all that stuff, everybody's wearing a mask and that protects the patients from us. Um, and uh, the patients also are wearing masks. Um, right. So, you know, right. it's, that's, uh, that's, that's new that, that I, I never thought of that. And now yeah. patients have to wear masks. As yeah. Well. Yeah. So, so everybody, everybody is, uh, is covered and protected in multiple layers, right? You know, we do believe the tests, they're extremely accurate most of the time, but you know, you want to go above and beyond to minimize any random exposure. Uh, Cause really, um, you know, I, I honestly, I tell my patients all the time and that was a good point you made. I, I feel more safe in the hospital these days than I feel outside of the community. And not that the prevalence of the community is not low, it, it is getting lower and lower and lower, but, right. but when it comes to the hospital, at least, you know what you're up against and, and uh, you know, social distancing is applied very aggressively. Right. Masks are there, testing and screening are happening. So, uh, and we have meetings at, the, at a smaller level daily and at a higher level bi-weekly where right. we discuss how things are going. We review the cases, we review what's coming in, what's going up. Um, and kind of all the principles of the hospital, we are the comprehensive stroke center, obviously, but you know, other principles, surgery, GBI, everybody else is reporting what's going on in their departments. And, and in the unlikely event, say that there is still a COVID patient that needs to receive care emergently for, say, a stroke or, or anything else that is done in a very regimented, very protocolized way. And uh, we have we have policies and procedures uh, to make sure that no exposure happens after that. Wow. So, you know, I, I, am, I am very reassured. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to be, to be there and work there. Yeah. Jason, tell us a little bit about the support group that's been going on. How did you twist and turn that around and, and show the support to the stroke patients? Uh, so at, at first, um, you know, they wanted to, obviously everything was shut down from the, the pandemic. I think our March support, support group was the only one that we actually missed because it, it happens the fourth Tuesday of every month at the hospital. And during that time is when everything just abruptly shut down. So we weren't able to kind of formulate a plan that quick, but Dr. Beckless and myself were talking. Uh, in April, we made sure that we um, called the patients, touched base with them, um, you know, emailed, text, phone messages, just to see how everybody was doing during that time. And then um, in, in the end of April, we started having Zoom conferences. How did so, they go? Yeah, I mean, they went well. Uh, a lot of the older patients or patients that have disabilities, um, unfortunately, weren't able to go. I just touched base with them after the fact. Um, sometimes people that have larger families or, or younger children, I guess, didn't feel comfortable. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't find a quiet place. Um, but the, the patients that we have are, are so dedicated, and they want to get back to a in-person meeting, not for themselves, but because they, re <clears throat> they realize that um, – there's other patients that are, are going through this that, that need help themselves. Uh, I mean, that's that, that's the the great thing about our Green? support group. Yes. It is that it's not um, <laughs> that it, it that they really are are not necessarily there for themselves. They're there for others. Yeah. Um, you know, and some people come just just to have uh, you know talk talk to other people that are going through it, or or just you know they have a question or, or whatnot. Right. But what I'm finding about now that we've been going on for uh, close to two years um, with the group is that it, it, they're there for other people. You know, they want to make sure that people that are, are fresh just had a stroke, family members that have questions, and that's what they're really passionate about. Um, we have a couple people that are truly dedicated, and, and it is um, it's very inspirational. It is, it is, and I, I have found that, you know, just bringing hope, that's what it's about, to bring the patients hope, especially those that have had just um, 
just suffered a stroke. I, and my long vision, I really think I would really love to work with hospitals to set up a team of immediate stroke support when someone is in the hospital and they, and they have been diagnosed as a stroke, then to have um, the hospital connect them to a stroke ambassador so that they can right away know that because the families don't know where they're going. They don't know what's going on. They're so fearful because yeah. they're looking at their loved ones laying in bed and you got to bring them hope to support them through the process. So that's my, my long-term vision. And I know there's a lot of strings that you have to pull because of liability and all that kind of stuff, yeah. but it would really be a wonderful asset to, to the, the families. There's a stroke patients being taken care of by doctors, you know, but the families need the help and the support through it. So that's my, so th put that in your little, in the back of your brains. For sure. And Renee, you, you're uh, making a very good point. Um, you know, you're talking about families being in the hospital. And that was the other challenge that came with Brian. Um, you know, we, we, we take care of these patients, right? And they're, the, they're seen by their family in, in, in some state. You know, they cannot move one side. They're rushed to the emergency room. These are moments that you really are still confused. You don't know what's going on. And, and, and that's, when, that's the last time you see your loved one. You know, they, they're taken in the hospital, the doors are closed, and that's it. And then from that point forward, all you hear is somebody on the phone telling you they're getting better or they're not. They're improving when they're not. And then when it comes to more severe strokes and, and decisions that, that are life and death, uh, it, is, it is tremendously difficult. Although most hospitals do concessions when it comes to end of life. Uh, conditions, but but still, you know, when you're trying to make decisions such as a tracheostomy, for example, and somebody who severe who suffered a severe brain injury, um, you know, how do you do that without seeing that person to, to see if that's the condition they want to be in? You know, just by description, right. uh, it's I not know. easy. It's definitely not easy, and and that's what we found uh, found in our uh, in our hospital. I, I couldn't tell you how much we sympathize with all these patients' families. Um, it was hard, you know, but it, at the same time, you know, you're in a, you're in a pandemic, so kind of the, the common good uh, ended up taking over. But uh, certainly very challenging for stroke patients. Um, they they need their families with them. They need the support. Uh, they do. And, and I, one of my big, yeah, I'm sorry, Dr. Vegas. Oh, one please. of the biggest things that I always talk about is love is one of the keys to recovery. Love and that constant support and and just because I remember as a stroke patient, um, not being able to communicate with them, but, but just the fact that they were there visually, that I felt them, it was just a comfort to me. And I, and I, you need that, you need that because your brain is so scrambled and you don't know what to do. Like you're in a zone that you don't know what to do. So it's so it's so incredible so i know that the the nurses and the doctors and everything had to be not only nurses and doctors but really had to be the support team they yeah. were going above and beyond i mean i've heard i've heard stories about you know um facetiming with a patient you oh, know yeah. just i mean you you that's not in your protocol but you right, had yeah. to do it to support yeah. and the better of the patient it really was well, Dr. Beckles, for example, um, you know, because he has such a, 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 you know, many patients that he sees, um, he's, he himself went to telemedicine for the first time, um, wow. you know, as a, as a way to adapt and, and, and make sure that all of his patients were getting the best care possible. Um, you know, a, a lot of places were, you know, he was able to do that uh, for the most part. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of the patients, say, say some of them might want it in-person visits but the majority of the people were at, at the time as you as you know afraid to get anywhere near a doctor's office or or a hospital right and, and uh, you know because of that we had to really go on the aggressive side for telemedicine and, and get, get people what they wanted they wanted a telephone conversation we did a telephone conversation they wanted a zoom meeting we did that they wanted a proximity call we did that uh, yeah. whatever uh, you know avenue 
could use to connect with them, we did because we also realized that a lot of these patients, stroke, brain aneurysms, uh, these are things that don't hurt. Uh, and because they don't hurt, people tend to ignore uh, and they end up with uh, very severe debilitating conditions wow. because of that. And, and so if, if we kind of uh, ignore the fact that, that they're a silent group uh, and we didn't connect with them in use of technology or otherwise, uh, most likely we would have had a lot higher number of uh, unintended consequences. Tell us a little bit about telemedicine, like, like, because I remember when it was in the forefront and, you know, because I was uh, on a team with the American Stroke Association down in Trenton, New Jersey, fighting, or I, I think I, that's when I went to Washington, D.C., um, yeah. insurances to cover it, you know, but I think that most insurances cover telemedicine now. Um, yeah. That's number one. And number two is, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you give an exam over telemedicine? Tell us sure. a little bit about that. So, so I'm, I'm smiling because you you just hit the nail on the head when it comes to insurance companies, right? So you you went you went to Washington. There's been years of, of efforts to cover telemedicine, advocacy, you know, groups and money spent on this, and it went nowhere, right? And it took a pandemic to get telemedicine covered by everybody in one day. Uh, so so it comes to show you sometimes that. Uh, you know, it's external forces that that move uh, that move decisions. Before before you continue though, because yeah. that's something that I don't understand. Because oh. I I work I work for a community now, uh, you know I work in the community world on my main job, and um, and you know we're we're in the situation where um, coronavirus is out of our insurance scope. So yeah. how, all of a sudden they decided. I mean, what? who made that decision? How did it come about? And how did it happen so fast? That's what I want to know. And that leads, us, that leads us to the other question that I had initially was, what did we learn in the stroke world from, from coronavirus? And this is one of the things that's important, that we need telemedicine. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And when it comes to stroke, obviously, you're, you're asking, how do you do an exam? Uh, you know, the, the neurological exam in terms of making a decision about the TPA, the cost of medicine, or whether you can do a medical comeback and do a type of test that you would do to, to revive the brain that's, that's at risk to die from stroke, uh, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. You know, you know, it involves asking the patient to do a couple of tasks. Uh, and, and typically when that's done in the hospital, uh, in a hospital setting, you have a nurse with a patient and, and the telephysician is on the screen. And actually, about a year ago, we implemented Telescope uh, at uh, the Stroke and Brain Angers in Central Long Island at Samaritan Hospital and our stroke hospitals, St. Joseph's Hospital, St. Catherine's, and St. Charles. So that service was there already. The platform was there. We were ready. Uh, and we were doing it in, in the inpatient setting. You know, and, and in some of our, even ICU care, we're mobile for telemedicine service. A lot of it was convenience to the patient and our ability to be at the bedside, you know, within seconds, uh, right. without, you know, without waiting for a doctor to drive in the hospital. Uh, and it was all uncompensated, as you understand. You know, there was no, there was no financial incentive. The incentive was obviously to provide better care. Right. Uh, now, now it became compensated all of a sudden. In the outpatient setting, when it comes to seeing a patient in the office, it's a little bit more challenging when you're trying to do an exam over the phone. Say you're at home, I'm at home, and you know you present with. You're not going to call me typically with weakness or you know stroke-like symptoms. Those would go straight to the hospital. But if you've had a stroke and I need to examine you down the line, it's going to be a little challenging. Maybe if somebody has aphasia, they cannot comprehend speech. That can be challenging if I'm, at, if I'm asking them to do something, even if they're with their family. Uh, or, you know, some other neurological problems like spine disease and other stuff. You know, you're asking them, you want to see their reflexes, how do you test their reflexes? Well, you we really cannot. And, and so these are the challenges and the limitations of telemedicine. So, you know, I think we went from nothing, uh, which was bad, to everything, which was a necessity. And we had to adapt, uh, obviously, uh, and provide the patients all we could. Um, now, if there was a situation, say, for example, somebody has a wound that operating on somebody that everyone in the room maybe is infected, that's not 
you know, maybe you can look at it uh, remotely and make a, a preliminary determination, but that's something that typically somebody needs to come in for. Right. And, so, and so, although I'm, like you are, a, a very strong advocate of telemedicine, I think chosen in the right setting, it can be life-saving, like telestroke in the hospital, tele, tele-ICU, uh, when you have a critical care attending offering services 24-7. These are all great services you need to be in place and need to be compensated. Uh, but uh, when it comes to other situations, I think it was a necessity and it was absolutely appropriate. But going forward, obviously, I, I, and you probably agree with me, there's nothing, there's no alternative um, to an in-person visit. No. But in situations like you're saying, where we can't offer that, we need to have the alternative to stay alive. Is it stroke? When it comes to acute stroke care, there's probably no difference when it comes to an evaluation via telescope or in person by a neurologist because the decision is very straightforward. You know, should we give TPA or should we not give TPA? Right. That determination can be done without checking at somebody's reflexes or, you know, without going into the details of the neurological exam because seconds matter when it comes to stroke. And anything we can do to decrease the time it takes from Presentation to treatment will increase the chances of somebody being free of disability and hopefully not dying. Wow. You know what I love about it is, um, you know, because to me, the most important thing is to know your patients, right? I mean, you know your patients. So, and if you're not able to get to the hospital as soon as one of your patients come in, I love the fact that you can, you can zoom in with them telemedicine. You can be part of the process. Sure. Um, while they're being cared for. And that is so important because you can see them visually about what's, how they're feeling and how they're Absolutely. going on with them. It really is important. Jason, I know that you, um, you know, you work with Dr. Beculus very closely. You, you work radiology, am I correct? Is that what yes. your position is? So how does that work into the stroke um, world? So we do, uh, I, I assist Dr. Beckles with the endovascular procedures. So, uh, you know, when, when a patient has a large vessel occlusion and we're able to go into the growing up into the brain with catheters and wires, um, that's where I, I come in. Um, I, I scrub in, I assist him, work the, the technology, the equipment, the, the table, things like that. Um, so then we also do aneurysms. Uh, AVMs, so anything endovascular neurosurgery, uh, that's Dr. Beckler's especially, and that's where uh, I try to assist as best as possible. I'll never, I always remember that. That's one of the things that sticks in my brain when I had my stroke was going for the, I guess it's the angioplast. Is that when they, because I, yeah. I remember it coming up and it being a wave of heat and me screaming. And I think they knocked me out or something. I just, because like, I was so like, I, I, I had no tolerance for pain. So, and plus I was just all over the place. I had no idea what was going on. Like it was just, it was, it was really a tough time. It was when I look back now, when I'm able to look back now, which I, I pray that we bring hope to all the stroke patients, you know, it's your new normal. Like the pandemic is going to be a new normal. And like, you know, mm. um, but every day is a new challenge, right? Um, it's just, it was, it was, it, it really was, when I look back, I want to bring hope to people to tell them that they can have a new normal. They can get better and stronger each day. It really. On our website, we have some patient stories. Uh, some of the patients like you wanted to let people know, um, you know, what kind of what they went through and that there's hope. And, uh, one patient, Christine, she was nice enough to, uh, to write in. I remember her story very specifically because, um, she had a, a blood clot in her brain, and uh, it stemmed from a car accident that she was involved in, and it was a complication of that. And she, we got her on the table, and, and we did the procedure, and when we were all done, um, she started crying. And I said, Christina, I said, why are you crying? And she said, um, you know, I think it just, it just hit her like a wave of what happened. Right. And I said, you're all done. I said, you're not supposed to cry now. You're supposed to cry before. And, and, <laughs> and it, it was, uh, and she remembers that and she shares that story. But I, we have a lot of stories like yours on our website to try to educate patients. Um, patient education is one of the center's main focuses. And uh, we try to do our best with that. Yeah, because it, it brings hope to those that have had strokes, but it also teaches people that it is preventable. Mo, you know, 80% of strokes 
is preventable if you go to the hospital within the four and a half window. Dr. Beckles, give us the give us the fast again so that everybody could because that's what we're, you know. Eighty percent of strokes can be prevented if you take care of it. So that's really one of an important piece to our awareness. Absolutely, you know I think we will never be tired to repeat this, right? And I think FAST is a great acronym because it, it integrates in the word FAST, the, the meaning of time. You know, Time is key and stroke, time is brain. We say that all the time. The faster you get to the hospital or to care, the, the greater your chance of no disability and survival uh, through either the clock busting medicine or the procedural mechanical thrombectomy that you described. Um, it is imperative to do everything you can fast. And, and also by fast, you remember face, arm, speech. Face means your face is droopy, um, or somebody that you're looking at, his face is droopy, her face are droopy. Um, there's arm weakness or leg weakness or incoordination um, and speech problems, right? Speech and ability to produce uh, speech or understand speech, difficulty finding words um, and confusion. Uh, and, and T stands for time again. Uh, it's time to call 911. And, and, you know, these are not the only stroke symptoms out there. You'll hear about those a little bit more esoteric presentations where, you know, you have, you have imbalance, you have a problem with vision. Uh, and, and so, and so some, some people now are changing the acronym uh, into D fast. Yeah. D stands for balance and eyes. And, yeah. and that's important too. But, but I think, you know, we don't want to remember a very long acronym. Fast is, is adequate. It will cover the majority of strokes that will benefit from uh, some sort of uh, endovascular intervention or uh, blood vessel medicine. Yeah, and what we always add to that is um, I'm very uh, a big advocate to let people know that when you do call 911, that you do let them know that it could be possibly a stroke. Absolutely. Give them the upper hand so that they know to go into stroke mode. I know they're gonna stay in the regular mode, but at least they're aware of something to look for and just like as time is of the essence. I know we have to go, but I wanna ask you about the team you put together. Cause I really, I really believe that in any, cause I was an avid softball player. My, my first you know, 40 years of my life, I was a crazy softball player, intense, but the, I've learned so much about a team and about leaders of the teams. And tell us, you know, about your leading the team and why you chose each person and how you went about doing that. Well, you know, it, it was very important when we were starting a program in a, in a hospital that I mean, in an area that was very much uh, not into stroke care. Uh, we really had to bring people that, that could uh, propel the, the program into existence and, and also into what it is today. Uh, and, and so, Picking each and every one of these folks was 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 paramount uh, to make that happen, uh, and because it's if you think about stroke, it's not a disease that involves just you know three people that do a procedure, but it involves the continuum of stroke care that spans from educating the patients, educating emergency medical providers, educating the emergency room, <laughs> then offering the uh, endovascular services creating a neuro ICU, and then eventually discharging these patients to a safe rehabilitation and making sure they never come back to the hospital. What we call breaking the continuum of, of, of uh, breaking the stroke care continuum. Because you know if, if you allow this vicious cycle of stroke, new stroke, hospital, out of hospital, in the hospital, then you have a problem. So, so this was, and, and in addition to everything that I described, we need to provide support for the survivors. So, so you are creating uh, not just, you're not bringing three people to do a procedure, but you're bringing a whole team of people who will take care of the patients at every step of the way. And we are willing to get out there, spread the word, <clears throat> and, and promote uh, this understanding. And in a very short amount of time, I think a testament to how phenomenal the team was, uh, was that in a very short period of time, you know, a hospital that wasn't offering the service of health system, that wasn't offering the service of an area that did not have these services. The uh, entire South Shore of Ohio transformed uh, when we started three years ago, transformed over six months into a comprehensive stroke center, the only one certified by the Joint Commission and the Department of Health uh, in, in Suffolk County at the time. 
and currently long on the South Shore, the first neurointensive care unit in Suffolk County. Think of that. Uh, yeah. You know, tremendous amount of work and uh, phenomenal, uh, phenomenal group of people uh, who, who, you know, believed in this and, and, and believed in us and made it happen. And obviously, I think key people uh, were involved from the very beginning, but these key people then chose the other people to join the team right. and, and built on it. And, and so that, that, was, that was paramount uh, for our group. And whose vision was it, Dr. Beckers? Was it your, because somebody had to have this idea in their brain. And I, I'm assuming that it was your, I think back in when we started talking, it was your vision. Like, because I, I think you said to us, like you had other opportunities at different hospitals, but you really wanted to make a difference. You really yeah. wanted to make a difference. Absolutely. You know, it, it was, I, I could work other places where centers were established, um, as a matter of fact, this was not on my radar, uh, but I, but I was I was recruited from uh, uh, by by a colleague of mine from the past when we were together at Dartmouth, and um, you know he spoke to me about the opportunity, and immediately I realized that first of all there's not a lot of places in the United States, and especially so close to New York City, uh, where there's such there were such profound disparities in the care for stroke. Uh, and and so we could in a you know a large population area, you know, Suffolk County, over a million and a half uh, people. Um, that that was a unique opportunity to really change the outlook uh, of stroke in the area. And I think the administration uh, of Catholic Health Services, Dr. Gershon, Dr. Shaughnessy, and the leadership of uh, the Nurse Science Service Line, Dr. Mullins, really saw um, that there was a need in the area and obviously it entrusted in me to realize that vision and to bring together the people that could make it into reality and I'm very grateful for that. Wow. Well I want to thank you for all the, the vision and all the work you do, both of you. Um, I see it and I follow you on Facebook. I follow you on LinkedIn. I'm always sharing. I'm always liking I'm always spreading the word and supporting and we very much appreciate it yes absolutely yeah. and anything because I like mm -hmm. I, I could see I you could not only can you see the goodness coming from you but you could feel the goodness coming from you you could feel the purpose behind it it's not about you it's about the mission it's about the goals it's about making awareness and better and I, I could tell you you could we could feel it we could feel thank it you thank you very much thank you very, very much, much yes. appreciate the support and uh listen at the end of the day we cannot do anything without the support of the community and su the support of people like you advocates uh, folks where you know you have the power to get the word out to not just one person but the multiple people all at the same time and so, you know, without you and without other leaders in the community, we wouldn't be able to do what we do today. And we are forever grateful for that. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. It's my 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 vision to to always remember why I had the stroke. What does it say? Make lemon lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, everything happens for a reason, and sometimes that reason isn't very. Uh, or isn't is it something that happens to you isn't very good. It's not ideal, yeah. yeah. But that, that's why I'm writing my, my next book. I'm in the extra inning of my life. Like, wow. what am I, I going to do? Like, I, I, I almost lost my life. I've always been an advocate softball player. It happened on the softball field, my stroke. So here's the extra inning. What are you going to do with that extra inning? What are you going to do with that extra inning? Thank you so much. We look forward to stay in touch with us, whatever you need Absolutely. us to do. And uh, we're there for you guys. Anything you want to say? Last, last. Uh, I would just like to point out if any patients have any questions about, um, you know, try to further patient education. That's a passion of mine. If they would like to go to our website, strokecarelongisland.com, uh, we have patient education links, um, resources, our support groups on there. If there's any questions, um, and it's open. I can't stress this enough to all patients. Our support group, um, you know. No matter if they were our patients or not, if they were treated at a different place, if they if they moved here, we've had patients reach out, and, and that's very inspirational. Um, so, and as me and you had talked before, this pandemic and, and going through Zoom, we may be looking into other avenues um, of ways of trying to connect with patients. Um, you know, that can't come to support group family members that are limited. 
So, uh, you know, hopefully together we can um, make this even better in the, in the next coming years. And maybe we could intermingle the whole United States with, you know, maybe we could talk about bringing people together of, you know, the, of, you know, somebody in California had a stroke. Maybe they can zoom into your meeting. It's so incredible, the Zoom and the, the connection mm -hmm. the world has now with the telemedicine, with the Zoom, you know, with the Facebook Live. The, the whole thing is really incredible. Incredible. Thank you so much, Jason. Dr. Beckett, do you want to put any last thoughts out? No, I think Jason summed it up very nicely. Again, I cannot thank him and, and the team for their support and you. And, uh, you know, I think the pandemic uh, changed what we do, but didn't change what we stand for. Uh, and I think we'll continue to advocate for uh, these patients and to treat them. Great. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. You we too. Blow our Thank kisses. you so much. And three, one, two. We always blow our kisses. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Jim. We're ready to roll. Now I believe that